Yeah. Thank you again, Ali, for the uh, honor of uh, presenting this interesting topic uh, here. And we already heard uh, and saw a lot of images about the Gore and the Medtronic uh, Stancraft, and I'm happy to add some images of the uh, Cook uh, double inner branched uh, Stancraft. Um, and I've set this up like uh, as the top 10 tips for uh, endovascular artery repair from my view. The reason why I uh, prefer uh, the Cook branch arch Stancraft that you see here on a um, drawing from Gustavo Odrich is that it's, it is uh, well controlled and in contrast to um, other uh, devices, it can be uh, released in a staged fashion so that parts of Stancraft still are restrained while you are able to man manipulate them. Um, the experience, recently published experience with about 30 cases from three larger centers has shown that it can be done with a, a low mortality even though patients usually have a high age and, and high comorbidities, but stroke, as pointed out before, remains in, an issue in these patients. Our, our experience in Hamburg until 2016 is that we have done 40 of those uh, patients. What you see here is the first uh, set of patients were mostly aneurysm and, and, and penetrating ulcer, and we moved more towards treating patients with a chronic type A uh, dissection. And as you see, mortality and stroke rate has uh, come down. These rates include the complete series from patient one. Um, the news about these, this uh, device is that uh, the company has added a third branch. Um, and this is a branch usually used for the left subclavian artery, which will allow further, uh, um, further access to the uh, visceral aorta in case this patient ne will need uh, further branch repair. So my first tip is, of course, case selection in these patients is issued. If you have a diseased ascending aorta, um, native aorta, this may not be the right patients, and you should restrict yourself to patients with a maximum diameter of 38 millimeters, and you need a, a length of at least four centimeters in the ascending aorta. Um, the first patient started with uh, aneurysm and penetrating ulcer, as I said, but we have recently uh, treated more and more chronic aortic dissection as, as these patients that you see here. And in these patients, it's most important that we uh, deal with relatively straight uh, supracoronary repairs usually, which makes our seal uh, easy, as you see in that example on the, uh, the right-hand side. If we have a repair that is, has more kinks and there, it is very important how it looks inside, whether this is uh, a, a circular suture or whether the graft is really kink, these cases are not really good candidates for branch repair for landing. As we have usually a, a Z-stand design landing in a um, uh, crimped, longitudinal crimped uh, open graft, it can be difficult to achieve a good apposition of the stand graft to the uh, open graft, and so in some cases it may be better to balloon here under a cardiac output reduction before uh, attaching the stent graft to the innominate and to the left common carotid artery. We like to combine ascending and arch grafts, uh, especially in the few cases that we have treated with acute type A dissection. Reason is that the proximal edge of the branched arch graft is not really thought to land in dissected aorta. It includes barbs, and, and the edges are not really made for this. So what we have done in these patients, we have been combining ascent uh, stent grafts. These are short tubular stent grafts, as you see in the drawing here, um, and combine it with a uh, with a branched endograft. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the cases. You see the entry is relatively distal to the sinotubular junction here with the ability to seal with a tubular stent graft. You see the Cook ascent stent graft here uh, to cover the proximal entry here and then the um, branched end stent graft landing in the ascent stent graft giving you uh, the result you see on the right hand picture. Um, it has become more and more our focus to look at different debranching options in patients with residual dissection, and the reason is that not uh, a, a large number of patients not only has these uh, entries proximal at the distal suture line, but also has dissections of the uh, supraortic vessels, and that these dissections need to be addressed um, uh, to be able to land stent grafts and, and really recreate a seal. 
So we have uh, done a number of cases where we have done uh, subclavian bypasses on uh, both sides. We have used axillary axillary bypasses in cases where we did not like to land in dissected innominate artery. Uh, in cases of carotid artery dissection, it may become necessary to have an interposition graft. This technique we also used in all our Marfan and Lois Dees patients that we treated with this technique. And of course, there are also endovascular techniques to create seal in dissected arteries, which you see here. Uh, a key uh, learning point for us was that it is uh, helpful to stage procedures uh, because you will have a shorter anesthesia time, less bleeding complications. As you want to have a heparinization with an ACT of around 300, this is not very well combined with the carotid subclavian uh, bypass. Um, this is an example of a Lois Dietz patient. As you see here, you required a lot of uh, stage debranching, including vertebral artery transposition on both sides and uh, carotid artery uh, interposition uh, grafts, and all these uh, things should not be done at the same time as the arch uh, endografting, as they require significant time. Uh, yes. Another learning point is that the, the false lumen embolization steps also can be uh, staged. We don't mind if we have at the end of the procedure still have a flow to the false lumen through one of the entry tiers in the super corner, uh, super uh, aortic vessels, um, as these uh, um, entry tiers and false lumen flow situations can be easily treated by coil embolization, etc., in local anesthesia later on. Preoperative planning, of course, is key, and uh, if you want to do these procedures, you need to get used to spend more time uh, in planning than in actually doing these procedures. Uh, what is needed is a dedicated workstation. Um, uh, Tarikon Intuition is one example, uh, and you need close cooperation with the planning team of the manufacturer that you work with. As you see here, this is just uh, uh, a part of the information you need from your uh, planning sheet, all the projection length and diameters of the, uh, of the, of the target vessels. Um, and as we saw in the previous presentation, we also uh, are planning to exclude the aneurysm from all the sides, including the false lumen backflow and addressing usually also all the aorta down to the celiac artery. We don't use branched endografting in all of the cases. Fenestrated arch grafts are still a, a good option in specific situations, and their advantage is that they are usually quicker, as they require only up to two hours usually. They treat different pathology, um, and you can avoid landing uh, in the native ascending aorta, which is a dangerous thing due to the risk of retrograde type A dissection. Um, this is the fenestrated arch graft from Cook that we, that we use. They usually have a fenestration for either the left common carotid or the left subclavian and a scallop for the, for the proximal artery. They especially well treat pathology at the inner curvature as the seal at the inner curvature will not be compromised by the fenestrations as you see in this uh, example here. Um, this technique also requires a stable seal at the level of the supraortic vessels that should not be larger than 38 millimeter, but it allows even to have enlarged aorta, so patients that don't qualify for branched endografting may qualify for fenestrated endografting as the seal zone is in a different area. So fenestrated and branched endografts uh, are not really the same procedures. They are completely different in planning and in the strategies. This is uh, just a short video showing you that we also work here with preloaded wires, and I would advise everybody doing these kind of procedures, also with Metronic and Gore, not to move the stent grafts partially open proximal, but keep it in the position uh, while, um, uh, while opening uh, the parts of the stent grafts. Then this is very similar to what you see in Gore and, and in the Metronic devices. You get a through and through wire here and add a stent to complete your procedure. Um, results so far have been um, mixed. You see that we have a 10% mortality in stroke rate, 
uh, but you need to keep in mind that this is, uh, includes the uh, initial learning curve and very old and sick patients. CO2 flushing is a very important step that I would uh, suggest to add to your procedure. A reason is that both in TVAR and especially in complex TVAR, stroke has a high incidence and it goes through all the parts of the brain circulation. And you should need to be aware that as in TAVOR, uh, you have a, a frequency of silent undetected uh, brain damage up to 90% of the, of the cases, and its mechanism is still unclear. And we need to take into account when we place the stent graft, we're not only delivering the stent graft, but we also deliver these kind of bubbles that in the proximal positions may end up in your brain circulation. So what we introduced is uh, that we have started flushing our stent grafts before flushing with a saline with carbon dioxide. As you all know, carbon dioxide is less uh, dangerous uh, to the brain, and we have seen that by doing this in a, a set of 36 patients, uh, we could decrease our stroke rate dramatically to a very low number uh, compared to other complex uh, arch repair. You should be prepared to change the plan, and this is one clinical case I'd like to show you. It's a patient with acute type A dissection, but also a torque-abdominal false lumen aneurysm, so quite a complex uh, scenario. Patient is uh, not, uh, not very stable and has already some pericardial effusion that was punctured and drained. In this situation, you see that we also use an ascending stand graft, and what you need to know here for this patient that he already had a Lima bypass. Uh, so we were kind of knowing that, but still were surprised that uh, when, we were, when we were opening the stent graft that you see here, this is the branch stent graft opening inside the, uh, the ascent stent graft. At that point, the anesthesia got very um, lively um, and pointing out that the patient had uh, significant ST uh, uh, changes, and uh, we realized that despite the uh, tapering of the stent graft in the midsection, which should allow flow to the uh, subclavian artery for some rotational error, probably as the graft was not made for this patient, uh, but we had on, on the just on the shelf, this was somehow obstructing the left subclavian artery. So we changed our uh, standard protocol and started with the second branch to the left common carotid artery, and the patient uh, did very well, and he recovered from his ST changes immediately. Uh, and had a, uh, had a good, uh, good final and, and geography and result. Um, then we come yeah, to this point that as a vascular surgeon special, we need to be very aware that there may be previous coronary bypass procedures as the, this one that may have easily been covered by the uh, proximal extent of the branch repair. Um, what is a, another important learning point that we learned to disregard the malrotation of the stent graft because this is nothing you can really influence because there are so many kinks on the way to the ascending order that you cannot control this by rotating the handle of the stent graft. And due to the special uh, constraints and uh, trigger wise that the Cook endograft has, even though it looks like this is at least 90, 90 degrees. Uh, set off to the 12 o'clock position where it is supposed to be. Uh, when opening the stent graft, um, the spiralizing wire will keep it to the, um, to the 12 o'clock position and it ends up actually where it's supposed to be. We also learned that in doubt we like to deploy the stent graft further proximal if possible. This is the innominate artery ostium. This is the funnel and the inner branch. So we like to have some distance because it will make cannulation easier. Same for the left common carotid artery. It makes it easier if you have the option of CT fusion, which gives you these anatomical landmarks for your deployment. And to conclude, fenestrated branch grafts are uh, feasible and successful in treating high-risk patients with arch pathology with an acceptable morbidity and mortality. It's, this technique is still under investigation and it has a, a limited evidence and significant learning curve. And as I forgot this uh, in the last presentation, I'd like to invite you all to come to Hamburg to a joint cardiovascular and vascular meeting with uh, Professor Jakob from Essen and we will uh, be only aortic topics and live cases there. Thank you very much. Uh, last but